Welcome into 2020, I'm James Russell and I wanted to release a special video on project sharing. Given the current trends around the world and having more and more people working at home, it's super important to still be able to work effectively as a team in Vectorworks in particular. Before I begin this video, as it's been a while since I publicly posted anything, uh, be sure to watch the current channel trailer for an update video. And if you feel inclined at the by the end of the video, there's a brand new 2020 Patreon if you're keen on supporting more public works like this. Firstly, the concept of project sharing. It's been around for quite a while, since about 2017 or so we tried starting playing with project sharing and it's been developing since then. I'm going to do two examples from scratch today and I'll leave down in the video description the timings of some of these items that you might wish to jump forwards to. I'm going to keep most parts short and sweet, however hopefully by the end you'll know exactly if project sharing is right for you and some of the things you'll need to watch out for along the way. Now, some important notes before we begin. Firstly, make sure that anyone that you're going to project share with has the same version of Vectorworks. It's fairly important because there are some changes in the back end there between 2018 through to 2020, so try and be on the same version if you can. Look, for some parts they will still work between versions, but it's best just not to play that game really. It's also important, and this is a really big one for me, that you know the skill levels of the people you intend to share your document with. There is nothing worse than being quite an advanced user and sharing a document uh, with a lower user uh, who doesn't quite understand things. For example, if they're used to just using layers and you're using layers and classes, they'll start drawing things in a different methodology than you might be used to. It's really important to define those parameters first and understand someone else's point of view. If you are working with newer users, there's a higher chance of them breaking some of these chains of workflows. So sit down with them, have a discussion, talk through things first before you actually go ahead and distribute a drawing. And if you do notice things along the way, be sure to pull them up on them. Another one, it's really important that you have a clear chain of direct communication with anyone who's sharing your drawing and any of your files. Email is just not good enough. It's not real time enough. You should be on Skype, WhatsApp, Gmail messages or Teams, MSN Messenger if you can find a working version. It's really important that you communicate and say, hey, I'm about to update. I'm about to change something. Uh, I've just pushed some things to commit. Can you check them over? It's so important that you go back and check in with people frequently because that's where things will be missed and that's where you'll have uh, classic between files on saving. Lastly, this isn't a perfect practice. Try as hard as Vectorworks might, it's a really tough thing to nail down between project sharing. Expect that you're going to break your working file occasionally. Expect that there's going to be conflicts between files and learn how to work around them. It's only through practice that you'll get this. It won't work perfectly the first time. You need to integrate it into your company workflow, into your personal workflow, working as a team. With a quick transition and through the power of movie magic, I now have two instances of Vectorworks running on my same computer. You'll see one here with a blue background, which is our primary machine at the moment, and we see one with a red background, which is going to be our secondary host machine uh, latching onto our project file. And you could do this with multiples, I'm just going to do it with these two for argument's sake. On the blue background, I currently have a very small project file, and like I said, we will do a more advanced tutorial after this, but I'm just using this as a very simple, basic tutorial. I have got some white boxes in front of me. The first white box is layer A, and you can see that in my drop-down menu, layer A, and I can touch all of the objects inside of layer A. My second drop-down or second box takes me to layer B, which is all of this item over here. And then finally on my background layer, I'll just force select that now, I've got a Barco projector that I've brought in here as a symbol, just so we can have a look at how symbols are integrated into the workflow in a basic example. Also a couple of classes, as you can see from this drop down, I have my class one and two, which reference this uh, red color and the blue color. So a very simple example to get us started today. And like I said, I'm going to take you through and create this project file from scratch. So at this stage, this particular file that we're looking at is just a simple Vectorworks file, nothing too special about it. To start a project file, and this is a really important one, you want to have a core of your drawing done. You want to have imported your DWG backgrounds, you want to have imported any PDFs that you might be doing, culling things back, uh, potentially putting title blocks on. So there's some stuff that you have to do before you actually want to create a project file. And it's all that stuff that you want to get out of the way and make sure that you set up a template essentially in the form that everyone can follow along and can join and work with. Obviously it depends on the project, but that's what I like to do is have everything set out quite neatly. I'm going to head up to the file menu in the top corner and choose project sharing about halfway down. 
This will bring up the new project sharing dialog and there's a couple of steps that we need to go through here. So the first one is how we're going to share this document and not necessarily who we're going to share it to, but what's the actual file format and file transfer protocol we're going to be using. And people get weighed down in this one. It's pretty straightforward. We're talking about two differences between the SMB file format and the AFP file format. SMB standing for server message block and AFP standing for Apple filing protocol. The easy way to go about this is if you use Macs, use the AFP file format. If you use Windows, use the SMB file format. That would be the easy solve here for me to say. There are some cross correlations here. And the big one for me is I generally use the AFP file format for myself. Natively, I most of the time work on Macs or collaborate with Macs, but also it is translating better between Windows as well. So it's up to you entirely. There is the dual option in not recommended brackets there, probably for some crossover reasons. But generally, Mac side, AFP, Windows side, SMB. If you're looking for the best cross-platform, I personally would suggest the AFP file format. Now, considering that I'm doing this on two Windows computers today, I'm going to use the SMB format. So that's just going to be me. My next option takes me through to the users. Now, I just happen to have named this second client Evil Semage from a previous project that I was doing, so I'm just using that as a replication today. And so Evil Semage is going to be the administrator of this document today. Always, whoever starts this project file will automatically be an administrator. You can change it later, but there must be at least one administrator of the file, otherwise you'll get locked out. So don't hand over the keys until you've got yourself outside the car, otherwise you'll be trapped inside. There's a few other options in here in terms of adding users. We can add users in before, if we know their credentials, if we know their name, we can allocate colors and other bits and pieces here. I find myself, I don't know a computer's name before I go ahead and add it in. I don't know what the user might be. You know, it could be, you know, user underscore 01. It could be Paul's laptop. It could be something like that. You don't always know who the user is going to be joining your session. So I'm going to show you a different approach to taking that, which is down here under the default permissions for new users. This is where we set up the different permissions levels for users. Now we will be talking about this a little bit later on, but I actually want to talk about this menu from bottom to top. Let's start with read only. That's pretty straightforward. You can open the document, you can have a look around, you can turn on or off layers, you can create save views and you can print. Apart from that though, you can never make any changes to the master document. You are just a read me only user. This is really good for showing to clients that you are doing work and you can send a link out to someone say, hey, join this Dropbox link come on board, let's have a look at this file together, etc, etc. They can navigate around, see some of your saved views, but they can't actually do anything and they can never commit. When they close the file, it will simply close and that's that. They don't get a copy. Next one up, we have layers restricted. And layers restricted simply means you can add and subtract things and move stuff on the layers that you've been given permissions to. You can't edit resources, although you can utilize them. You can't activate scripts inside. So you're just restricted to simply moving, adding and subtracting objects inside of the layers that you've been given. Next is the layers unrestricted, which is very similar to its little brother, the restricted mode. So you can still add and subtract and put objects onto the layers that you've been assigned to. You can also, however, edit and add your own layers on top. So if all of a sudden you decide, hey, I'm a lighting designer, I've been given access to the lighting grid layer, but I'd also like to add a floor layer of lighting, you can go ahead and add a layer inside of there and make that your own and then return that when you eventually finish with it. You can also set up save views and a couple other view parameters as well. So you're kind of just getting that next tiny little step up. One jump above that is layers and resources. And this is your, your typical worker. That's what you'll be setting up. They have access to the layers that they've been allocated or checked out. So that's all cool. You also have access to the resource browser. And so you can edit resources in there, inside of there. You can change the colors of things. You can say, make new trees. You can make new textures, new hatches. You have access to the resource browser. And so that's the next level of trust up. Next is the project level of access. Now this is pretty much you can access everything. You can edit resources, you can do everything that all the sub levels can do. The only thing you can't do at the project level is add and delete users. That's pretty much it. It's only administrative that gets to access who can come in and out. Everything else can be controlled by your project leads. And then obviously administrative just above that. Now there's many different trails of thoughts on how you should add users in, where they should belong. Realistically for me, if I trust everyone, then they're probably gonna come in at layers and resources or project level, that's if I know who I'm working with. Otherwise, you can throw this down to layers unrestricted or layers restricted. It's somewhat up to you. Uh, for example, if this is an external contractor, they're probably going to go down into one of these two here. If it's someone that I trust in my organization, organization they're going to go in here. So for today, I'm going to do layers, let's do layers restricted as everyone will come in as the lowest form that we can possibly do down there. 
you can edit, you can delete, and you can actually import their permissions from a previous project if you've worked on them before, and obviously then your previous project knew their computer name, their username, all the things that would fill out this field. You can actually just steal all that info using the import project button. Next we've got our layers. Now this is what I was saying about master layers. Some of these layers we might want people not to be able to touch, as in no one can touch them. For example here my background layer, using the star column I will make a master layer. A master layer means that no one, except for administratives and sometimes project, can edit. Uh, are allowed to touch this layer and play with this layer. This is really good for things that you know in a venue won't shift. So talking about the entertainment world here, you know that you're not going to probably touch your walls inside of a venue. You're probably not going to change the house rigging points, fixed rigging points in a ceiling, roof structures, floor structures, subfloor structures, things that in an event we wouldn't go ahead and touch. And then you'll have all these movable things like potentially seating banks, you know, they can interact with those or uh, flown bars that they might want to move eventually, grids uh, bars that they might want to take out. So those things you may want to still be actionable. Inside of here you go through and pop a star on anything that shouldn't move. And this avoids that situation of a couple of weeks after someone's been playing with the drawing you realise they've moved the house rigging points a metre forward. Something that is welded to a beam that shouldn't have been moved. By ticking a little star here it gives people that warning and a little flag will pop up and say hey you shouldn't be touching this, that's a bad idea. So go through and add a star to whatever you want to do here in terms of layers. I'm just going to lock down our background layer, which is just the white boxes in the background and my nameplate down the bottom. Finally, backup policy. I get a lot of questions about this. What should I be doing in terms of backups? What, how often, etc., etc. Now, there's different methodologies to working and everyone has different, different opinions on this. My opinion is the following. I believe that you should be backing up every single commit. We have near infinite storage spaces. Most of the projects we're working on, a couple of, you know, maybe 10, 15 meg is some of them. Sometimes you might stretch up to 100 or 200 meg if you're lucky. And that's where you need to make that call is how often you should be backing these up. I've got near infinite storage space these days combined with G Drive, Dropbox, and just on my personal computer. So I actually quite like to do one. Every single commit, I want to save the project file. Every time someone returns their folder back to the library, I want to make a change here. And it's up to you here. I actually like to do a custom location. And I'm just going to show you here as I scroll through into my project sharing examples. We'll come back and talk about this in just a moment. But I actually like to have a dedicated projects backup folder so that the master file, which we'll talk about the structure in a second, is sitting outside of this folder and every backup is listed inside. Like I said, we'll come back and talk about this in just a sec. So I'll be selecting that folder. And, and I like to keep the X most amount of backups. Now, like I said, we have near infinite storage space. So you could throw 10 in here, you could throw 20, you could throw 50. It doesn't really matter. I like to see every track change. So if someone does end up moving something, say they move the house truss, I will know that that's been moved and I can go back in time and see who moved it and fix that error because I have the previous files. It's the same as the permissions that I set up when I'm ever working with a regular document. You'll often see me do three or five minutes backup time and I'll keep the 10 to 15 most recent backups because that gives you 30 to 50 minutes worth of backups when, oh, I deleted something, let's go back in time. And then we hit the finish button. Now what will happen is our screen will flicker here for a second. It will say this is a new working document and this is telling us that we've created a project file and now we're working with a sample of that file. I'll hit OK, my screen will flicker. I won't save a backup at this time. And what you'll notice up in the top here is that the file name has changed with the user's name, in this case Evil Semich, which is my name, and then a VWXW file, in brackets here, working file. Let's talk about the structure of these folders now. So I'm just going to bring Explorer over, as you see it transition across here, and I want to talk about the location that files should be saved. And this is somewhat relevant if you're working on G Drive, if you're working on Dropbox, another sharing platform, or if you're working locally. You need to think that these are two separate realms that you should be saving your files. And I've got them here as folders. A hosted file should be on your server or cloud, and then your local files should be on your computer. So let's have a look in the local files. And you'll see there is my basic project sharing example, Evil Semich. That's this file here that's in the background of the blue computer, as well as a Bechtworks backup it started to generate in the background. So that is my working file that Evil Semich is currently working on. Jumping back to the project sharing examples though, let's have a look. Our hosted file, this is on your server, on your G drive, on your cloud. Jumping inside, I've got two folders in here, one for our advanced tutorial later and our basic tutorial now. 
Jumping inside of that, you'll see here is our project file. And as I drag this across, you'll see it's a Vectorworks project file. This is our master file, okay? And it's really important that everyone you're sharing to, be it on Drive, uh, on Dropbox, locally hosted, or some other format, has access to read, write this file. Because when they finish making their changes on their local computer, they have to then commit those changes to this file right here and they go here are my new offerings to you and the file goes thank you very much i will culminate these and have them ready to share again you'll also notice that project backup now like i said i like to have a backup folder and i don't think there'll be anything in here yet because we haven't made any commits but i want any copy of this that's made anytime there's a commit i want the old version to be taken from here and put in that project backups folder and like i said for me that's every commit you can make it every five commits every 20 commits it doesn't matter how it's obviously up to frequency and file size but i like to have a project backups folder sitting right there that i know those backups are going to be living in it's really really important so just keep that in mind we have some local files that we're going to be talking about stored on your computer or your client's computers. And we have that hosted file, which is going to live on our server or on our cloud. So the blue computer has its file. It's working away quite happily. Let's flick things around here and jump onto the red computer. And from here, I'm just going to do a file open. Remembering this is technically a separate user over here. So file open. And you can see I'm inside this server folder here, which could be on your drive, could be on uh, Dropbox, anything like that. I'm going to jump into the basic and select this here, which is just to remind you our project file. This is our master Vectorworks file hosted somewhere that all of these are taking a sub branch of. So we'll select that and hit open. And what we should see in just a moment is a dialog box pop up and says, hey, you can't open a project file directly. Take a branch of this, a copy essentially of this file, which is yours to make changes to. So we'll hit OK on that. And what we should see in just a moment is a near identical copy of the blue computer replicated onto this red computer. Give it a moment. And there we go. Units have changed. Layout's pretty much the same. The first thing I'm going to do with this particular file is head on up to File and look at our project sharing settings. Jumping across to the Users tab, you can see here Evil Semage is the administrator of this. We are currently logged in as Semage, who is a layer-restricted user as we chose just before. Let's head on over to our blue computer now and have a look at the project sharing here. You'll notice under the Users tab, instantly, it's recognized that another person has jumped on board this particular project file, which is kind of cool. Now I could either upgrade their permissions if I wanted to from here and push that back down the line, doesn't really matter to me. Um, but the point is the moment that that person has opened a new working file from the project file, the blue computer has picked it up and says, hey, there's another person in, another person is playing the game. So that's kind of nice. We'll leave it as layers restricted until we hit a blockade. Groovy. So over on our red computer, what would we like to do next? The ideal thing is that we could try to move something here. The moment I try to move something, so let's, for example, go to layer A. And I'm going to trick up, try and pick up this white hexagon that's on layer A. The moment that I pick up something, and you can even see it in the tooltip here, you'll get this warning message. And the warning message says, hey, you're about to move this entity, polygon A, which is on layer A. Do you want to check this out? Essentially, are you going to make this change? And you can say, yep, I'm going to do that. It's going to ask us the reason that we've chosen to check this out because everyone has to be accountable for every change that they make. And I'm going to show you a better way to do this in a moment. I just want to do this as a basic example. So I'm just going to say moving poly example. You can also check this box later on down the track if you just want to use existing comments if you're getting really friendly with the people you're working with. So I want you to note I've moved that polygon here. On the blue computer, however, you can see it has not yet moved. And that's because the changes that I've made on red computer haven't been pushed to the project file and then haven't been updated by the blue user. Let's go ahead and do that now. So really basic, file, save and commit. This time we're asked about a commit change. So why am I committing this? Now it's actually the same example thing that I've done here. And this checkbox is pretty important. Automatically release my checked out layers and objects. That means I'm finished for the day. And ideally you only do this maybe once, twice, three times a day or on demand. And that's why it's really important to be talking with your other work group members and figuring out, hey, do you need me to commit? Do you want to see my changes that I've done, etc., etc. You're not doing this every five, 10, 20 minutes. It's more like a two to three times a day thing. We'll hit okay on that. 
Additionally, because I haven't yet saved this brand new file that I'm currently working on on this computer, I'm going to go to my local files. So imagining that this is a separate computer that I own, not the same computer that Evil Semage has, just happens to be the same folder in this example. So you can see Evil Semage's document there. And this is a separate branch down here, okay? This is my file that I'm working on. Like I said, this would be your documents, your uh, local desktop, wherever you save your documents. Don't save it with the project file. Okay, so your next question might be, well, the blue person over here, let's switch those screens around, the blue person doesn't see that change yet. And this is why it's really crucial that you could be working on, say, WhatsApp together or another communication program, because you can say, hey, I've just updated the lighting layer. Hey, I've just updated the polygon. You guys should push for a change. Because at this stage, my computer doesn't know about it. If I was to close my file and reopen it, it would probably find out and get a change there. However, there's a really easy way, and you can actually probably see it up in this top corner here. There's a little golden icon next to the refresh, and that says, hey, someone's made a change to the project file while you've been working. Why don't you click this button? It's a good one to keep an eye out for. We'll click that button now, and what we should see is that polygon has moved. It's gone to the master file, it's picked up and said, have you got any changes for me? And it's pulled it back down and moved that file for me. Now it can get really tiring, and I'm gonna jump back to the red computer here, so let's flick that around. I'm on the red computer, which has access to restricted layers. It can do stuff on layers, which is fine. It can get really tedious though, every time I wanna move something, for example, this red polygon here, if I try and move that, I have to wait, and then I receive this message saying, hey, this operation needs you to check out this one entity. And that can be really frustrating because you constantly move one item, move one item, and it's like, check out this one, check out this one, check out this one. Let's talk about an easy way to do this instead. So I'm gonna click no. Instead of just checking out singular items, we can actually check out a whole layer. So what I'm gonna do is go to my layers tab for a second, which is the organization panel, the small stack of paper just next to your layers. And with the organization panel here, I'm going to right click on my layer A. Notice there's a new option down here called check out. And this allows you to check out the entire layer as a whole. So I'm gonna check out layer A um, because I'm doing a demo with layer A. There we go. Now this could be a lighting layer, it could be story one of a house, it doesn't really matter, but this layer now is owned by me. And it means when I go back, all I can do now is grab anything I want on layer A and move it around freely because I own this entire layer, making this really awkward and ugly, but that's okay. I own the entire layer. I don't own layer B, so if I was to touch something on layer B or the resources layer, I would get in trouble and that warning message would appear, but I can continually do things on layer A. That's really cool. Let's jump on over to our blue computer now, and I wanna have a look at a few of these particular items that are on layer A. Now, notice, no update over on this side. The first thing I'm going to do, however, instead of trying to play around with these, is just go to my file, project sharing. From project sharing, I now get a very different overview of my layers. And I want you to have a look here. Layer A is grayed out currently, and it says the owner is Semage. Checked it out on this date. I've modified some stuff around here. And the comment that I put with it is because I'm doing a demo of layer A. That's kind of cool. So now if I try and grab that, and we'll just go over and say I jump onto layer A, which I can still preview and look at, and you'll notice it's grayed out as well here in my layers overview. If I try and grab one of these and move it, I'll get this error message. You can't do this because layer A is currently owned by Semage. It's currently owned over on that red computer. And so I'd go, okay, well, I can't do anything about that. Can I at least see the changes? Well, there's no changes committed yet up here in the top corner. So I might say, hey, James, I know you're working on layer A at the moment. I can see that, and that's cool. I'm just wondering if you can show me your updates and where you're up to. And I'm still working on the red computer. Let's flick that around. So on my red computer, I can go, yeah, no worries, evil James. I can just go ahead and go save and commit. And in this instance here, I'm not going to release these items. I'm still working on them, but I can give people a look at what I'm doing. So I'll hit OK. And then after a moment, you can see I've been committed, and you still have exclusive access to the layers I've checked out, so I can keep working. But because I've got that constant dialogue, let's jump over to blue, bang over here, notice the exclamation mark, and I'll click that. It pulls the changes from the server in real time, and those changes have been applied to this document, yeah? So two-way integration, both working on the same file, both working on the same principles. And just to reaffirm this for you, for example, I could now, on my evil profile, check the entire of layer B out, so we'll go check out here. I don't even need a comment if I don't want to, but I can. 
I can then jump on over here and activate that layer, move a few of these things around like so. Clearly some changes have been made. And again, if I wanted to, I could save and commit those. And over on my red computer, same thing. Let's flick that around. I've got that little refresh icon appearing. And when I click that, the things jumble around. So this is real live two-way integration between these two documents. A lot of things arise the moment that I go about doing this. A lot of questions. How do I get commits back? Uh, how do I release things from users if I need them back ASAP? What do I do if I can't get in touch with someone? The biggest takeaway from this small example that I want you to have is that you should be in two-way communication at the same time, real-time communication with someone who's working on documents. Do not share a file with someone unless you have a constant chain of communication with them or a really good setup workflow that you understand between the two, three, ten, however many of you work on a document. It's crucial that you can update people and say, hey, I'm making a commit now, wait and get my commit. Hey, can you release this please because I need access to it. The next thing I want to talk about is classes because classes are super important as well. And you can see here, I've got the red class and the blue class, which I'm calling class one and class two. The red user at the moment, if you remember, is still on layers restricted. So that means they can check out a layer and they can have a play around with that layer or multiple layers. And you can even see here, this rectangle is currently checked out. If I head on to my classes, which is this small tree diagram in the top corner, you could also do tools organization and jump across to your classes tab. Notice the moment that I jump in here to try and change class one, Boom, you do not have the permission to edit this. You need the project level or above. Project level defines all of our class structure. And it's really important to know where these lines in the sand are, because some people would think layers and resources would be enough to get in here. It's in fact classes, uh, the project level which controls classes. So it's really important to know that. In addition to this, it's really important to note that I also can't make a new class at this point in time. So even if I wanted to, I couldn't. So you need to think about the restriction you're placing on your users here. Let's now jump over to our design layers tab. You can see layer A here in blue, which means I've got it currently checked out. And there's other options we could look at here for who's got what. And if uh, the blue computer decided to check out layer B, I, that would be grayed out to me at the moment. You'll notice though, remembering that the red computer is layers restricted. I additionally can't make a new layer. And note this dialogue here, you do not have permission, layers unrestricted. So let's go up a step here. I've done some drawing, having a great time. This is really cool. But at the moment, just to recap, my project sharing tells me that as a user, I'm layers restricted. Let's fix that. Flicking back to the blue computer, because that's currently the admin in this situation, I can head to my project sharing tab over here, go to users, find Semich, the real one, there he is, and I can now change him from a layers restricted to a layers unrestricted. And note, I don't know if you saw it there, create and delete layers, edit layer attributes. Layers restricted doesn't have that. Move it one up and all of a sudden you do have that. We move on down and hit OK. We hit OK here again. And in real time over on this side on the red computer, let's flick that around. We should now see that our project sharing has updated to show that we're now layers unrestricted. In real time, that push, because I've got two-way communication with that project sharing master file, just the same as we did before. Now heading on up to our organization panel. If I drag that back over here, you'll note I have the ability now to go new and I can make my own say layer C. There it is in the middle. We'll hit OK. I'm on layer C and just as an example, I'll just draw a white box over here of a similar size to our other friend. There we go. And that's our layer C box, just pushing the two way fact. Let's go ahead and file. We'll save and commit and we might release all these things now. Commit, finish demos, added layer C automatically release these. So let's get rid of that so that we have no more ownership on this file. And flicking back to our blue computer, let's turn that around. Right up top corner, you can see the exclamation mark again. We'll click OK on that. It'll go ahead and pull those changes down. And there we go. That box has appeared in the corner there. Also in our drop down, we can see a new layer C has appeared. All of those things have been checked out successfully. 
Finally, for our basic example, let's flick back to the red computer for a second, which is our client computer. I'm on layer C, and I'd like to have a look at the resource manager, which I'll just bring in for a second. There we go. This is our basic example with the projector we used before. So if I'd like to use that projector again, boom, there I can. And I've actually scaled that projector down to fit our current example. Give me a second here to do that. We'll just chuck some symmetrical scaling. It's not ideal. I should have actually scaled my drawing first. There's a tiny little projector that I've used as a symbol. Cute. So I can quite happily bring symbols in of any variety, whatever I'd like to do, I can bring those in. That's cool. However, and this is going to be a really bare bones tutorial if you've never made symbols before. If I just go ahead and make this little rectangle, that's cool. Let's pretend that I want to make that into a symbol I'd like to use again and again. We would generally head on up to our modify create symbol command. It's interesting it doesn't stop you here, which is where I would probably stop you if I was a programmer. However, it gives you the opportunity to create the symbol, which we'd call square 01 or something similar. Hit OK. It then still lets us go down this path of creating this and choosing a destination for this symbol. And it's only then later on that it tells us we cannot make this, we cannot actually make this symbol because we don't have the layers and resources level of permissions. So that's really worth noting. You can't actually make a new symbol. So it's great for people who are, say, hanging lamps for you on top of bars. They can go ahead and do that. They can even build trust structures if they want to. However, they cannot make their own resources. And this is that layer of trust going on. We'll hit OK on that. My regular rectangle is returned to a rectangle, not a symbol, as expected. Same thing goes for editing symbols. So if I tried to right-click and choose to, say, edit the 2D component of this, it simply tells me I can't do that at the moment because I don't have the permissions, which is a real shame but that's all about project management. So we can place down symbols, we can play with symbols, we can rotate, edit, look at them. We just can't take it to that next step unless we were turned up a level. The obvious conclusion here is that we can actually take this user up the next level if we wanted to. So let's once again, just for the sake of example, flick that around, go to the blue computer, which is our admin at the moment. We're going to go project sharing. We will grab this user, which is Semedge, and we will give them the ability of layers and resources. Once again, that one tick up, edit resources, hitting OK and OK in real time over on this side, just to confirm. So we're flicking around to the red side here, file, project sharing. You can see under the users tab that I now have layers and resources privileges for this user. And just exactly the same as I did before, if I try and right click and edit, say the 2D component of this projector, now instead I can, you can see, I could say, grab the lens of this unit and just for argument's sake, make it uh, my maroon red. Beautiful. We might do that to the body as well, just so that you can see the change. I've effectively changed this 2D resource, hitting exit up the top there, and you can see it has affected the symbols in the top and the bottom view there. So those are your different tiers of operation. Project is, once again, one step above this, editing some master layer access and a couple other bits and pieces. But really, most of your users will be sitting here. The so one thing to remember back at the start there, classes can only be changed by the project level. So even here at the resource level, I still don't have access to that class. Yeah, it still locks me out and says you need project or above, which is really interesting because I kind of see that if you are at the stage of altering symbols, then you probably also should be at the stage of altering classes. But that's what that project re reservation is there for. It would be interesting to see in the future if they want to include another subcategory in there that can't edit the resources, but can edit layers in classes and whether that needs to be thrown in the mix. That's the end of our basic tutorial here. So we've got two users working on the exact same file concurrently. They can save, they can update. At the end of the day, the big things that I want you to take away from the basic example as I go ahead here and file close and release both of these, which is a menu command that essentially releases anything that you had a handhold on and also pushes it back to the server. Do you want to commit or discard all your changes is what it's going to ask me because we're essentially closing our document for the day, saying that you've modified some stuff. I'm going to commit these. I have to write a commit comment, which is that I added projectors and changed symbols. That'll all be notated and we'll have a look at that in just a moment. And my file is now closed back to my untitled one that was sitting in the background. Let's flick on over to the blue computer just to kind of summarize a few things. Firstly, note there's no projector here yet. If I jump on up and hit that uh, refresh button in the top corner, there are my projectors with their new changes that have been made. We should be able to see under the project sharing up the top here, everything's been 
submitted back to me. There's no owners with anything checked out at the moment. Additionally, I can have a look back at the history. So here's the history of all the changes that have been made. So, you know, uh, I took a few things out on layer B. Uh, I took on my Semage account, took uh, layer A. We created layer C and made some changes there and we changed some projectors as well. One other thing, you can hit this edit button if you want to go and have a look at one particular entity time. If you're cleaning up your document and need to add some more comments in there as a master user, you can do that. You can clear the history, but I wouldn't. There's no point in doing that. You can also export the entirety of this as a CSV file if you need a constant record of who's checking things in and checking things out. So this is really, really cool. Last thing, just quickly talking about it. If you remember the backups, and this is what I was talking about earlier, one commit, so every commit, make a custom backup in this backup folder and keep the most 10 recent backups. And if I go ahead and grab that folder that we were talking about before, here's our basic example folder. Pop that about here. You should see in this project backups, here's the previous major commits, all of them being saved back in time. And I can open each of those individually if I wanted to or recover data from them. If someone deletes a master trust, I can pull it back out if I need to. So it's really important to me in particular, particularly while your file is quite small, just keep those changes coming. So let's close that, close that, and let's look at an advanced example now. Welcome now to the advanced tutorial. So knowing everything that we built up over the basic tutorial, we're gonna put it in practice in one of the jobs that for me didn't go ahead, but I still did a design anyway for it. We're gonna use it for this practical example today. Same as before, blue computer there and the red computer still running on the other side. So two independent users, Evil Semage being the one that has the picture on it at the moment and uh, Real Semage being the one that is in red up in the top corner. So this little project I was designing, I think it was a 10 meter by 10 meter stand for an interactive for kids aged seven to nine. And this was to encourage them to learn about mining and control operations and other bits and pieces. So just to give you a look, this is the little stand that we uh, designed. Uh, didn't go ahead with this particular client, but it's a great one to use anyway. And you can see there's various bits and pieces in this design. The target of this would be installed in some sort of exhibition space, probably have lighting rigs above it, have other stands built in uh, in the same area, standard kind of blue carpet on the ground. Just before I go ahead and take this to its project uh, file state, I just want to show you the layers listing quickly, just so we can have a look at what we're talking about. I've got the stand build, very simple layer structure here. Obviously, we could have multiple layers and multiple classes. I've kept things simple. I've got a hidden layer down here, which is some of my previous designs that I was working on. I've got the stand build, which is everything that you see here in the background. I've got an animations path track uh, on the layer above, and I don't really want people touching that necessarily. And then I've just got a temporary truss layer above for a lighting designer to come in. Whether it's me or someone else, didn't know that at the time. So knowing all of that, I'm going to hit OK. And this file here really is pretty much ready to go out to Project Share if I'd like to. The one thing I'd advise you to is never send a project file out either, and I know there's a lot of things here to remember. Never send it out in a rendered form like I've got it here. So always try and return that back to a plan form, which for me looks something like this. Uh, it just means that when that person first loads that project file, it's not so intensive on their GPU and CPU powers. So there we go. Got my lovely little stand in a plan view at the moment, and I'm going to head to File, project sharing. Quickly running through these, as we have learned about a lot of them in the basic, choosing between SMB and AFP, once again, Windows versus Mac is somewhat the easy mode here. Um, I'm going to choose SMB on the Windows platform today. Administrative users, there's me, Evil Simage yet again. How would I like people to come in now? I am pretty trusting in this particular project, so I'm going to bring people in at the project level. And that's mainly because it's me working on it. I trust me to work on that. So anyone coming in will be project level. Classes and layers. Now, like I said, I want to lock the animation layer down. I don't want anyone touching that. And I'd probably like to lock down my previous designs. I don't really want people playing with those. They can have a look and play with the stand. And ideally, this person coming in, the other version of me, is going to be a lighting designer placing some truss and lights down for me. Lastly, my backup policy. Once again, I'm going to do every one commits. Uh, I would like a chosen location, in this case project sharing examples, hosted file, advanced, and inside of that folder I've already made a project backups just to keep things neat in my file structure. And I'm going to once again keep the 10 most recent backups just because this file, even though it is 50-ish meg, uh, I'm going to keep backing it up every time. We'll hit finish there. Things will flash around for a second and it will say, hey, you've made a project file, now you need to open the working file. We'll hit OK, noting up in the top here, it's actually already done it for us, there we have a new working file. Additionally, I just want to show you, and I'm going to bring my Explorer window across. 
This is our Windows Explorer inside that cloud hosted file, wherever that might be again. Drive, Dropbox, could just be locally hosted, whatever you need. Inside my advanced folder, this is my project file. We don't want to touch this fella. He's very, very special. We're now taking branches off that project file to work with. Now that that's all done, let's flick over to our red computer. So the red computer, same kind of deal. We're going to go file, open. We've landed in the same location as before. We're on our cloud hosting. And because we don't yet have a file, we have to request one from the project file. So I'll jump into the advanced folder. There's our project file. And the moment I hit open on that, a request is made to the project file and says, hey, I'd like to uh, join the project file. And this document has to be duplicated and then becomes a working file. So we'll hit OK. And there we have it on both computers. Now the blue and the red machine have a carbon copy of this working off the same master file, but sharing different elements. Just reflecting back, and this is a change from previously. As opposed to coming in at a low user level, I've come in at the project level, which is pretty rad. Now, as previously mentioned, the red computer is going to be filling the spot, in my case, of a lighting designer. So we're going to go to our layers listing, and then we're going to go over here and take the truss layer instantly and check that out. The checkout reason in this case is going to be, let's call it editing truss. It's actually creating and editing, we should say. So that's my reason for checkout. And then in addition to that, I actually, because I can at the project level, I'm going to make a new layer as well called lighting. This layer will actually automatically be checked out because I've made it and it's, it's mine essentially. So now I'll hit OK. And I'm now free to toggle between these two and create a design. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. You can see highlighted in blue, truss and lighting owned by my color blue in this particular instance. On our truss layer, I'm just going to go ahead and do a little design here. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. It's just going to be a very simple design, so I might just speed this up. All right, so after that brief intermission there, uh, you can see that I've made my stand up, which is kind of nice. Uh, I've been a lighting designer. Look, I'm not, I'm not the best one out there for sure. I've just hung a few lamps and a few hoists in place, but this is my final result is this C-shaped truss above the stand. Just a few um, Fresnels hanging directly downwards. Obviously I would focus those in 3D later, assign them attributes, give my hoist labels, do my braceworks assessment, all that kind of stuff. But that's what it currently looks like there. And give you a quick render, Noting that my world has gone dark there because I don't have a global light source at the moment, but you can see that this is now ready for action. Take that back to a plan view. Having a brief look at our blue uh, representation up in the top right hand corner, which we haven't done anything in the blue document, it's been a very lazy day in the office for blue, uh, whereas red's done a fair bit of work, we want to update blue with our progress essentially. So blue could be sitting there going, hey, have you done much work? What are you up to? Etc. Etc. And we've said, well, we're actually finished for the day. I'm ready to check out and let you do some work over there. So let's have a look at how that collaboration could work. The ideal workflow would state that either red would message blue and say, hey, I'm about to do a commit, is that okay with you? Or blue would message red and say, hey, are you done for the day? Can you please commit? Either way, it's really important to have that dialogue happen. As soon as it's done, up in the top here, we would do a, I'd do a file save, which saves the work at my end, which is really good. Note this dialog, your changes have been saved to your working file, but not to the project. That says essentially you haven't returned stuff back yet to the project file. So no one knows those changes. So that's me saving on my side of things. And then if we are done working for the day, we would head to file and we would hit close and release. Once again, the save and commit option is there. So if you want to keep working and just update people, you can without closing. In this case, I'm going to choose close and release, meaning I'm done for the day. This dialog appears here asking us if we want to commit or discard our changes. This is talking about, do we want to update the project file? Which yes, we do by committing our changes. We'll then be asked to give a commit note. What have we actually changed? And our comment from the hire before is actually still relevant. Creating and editing trusses. I might also include added lighting layer 
and hung lamps. There we go. We'll hit OK and this is essentially updating the project file. That took around 10 seconds to save that file, but let's flick back over to Blue. Now, as mentioned previously, Blue still has no idea about the lighting changes. So if we have a look in our drop down, you can see we don't actually have the lighting layer there. It does know, however, and we can check this out over on the project sharing side of things, it does actually know that there is a lighting layer that's been added over here and there's a trust layer. These have got commit warnings, which means essentially these are out of date for me and I need to go grab them. You'll also notice once again, just repeating this in case you missed it, this little exclamation mark next to your refresh symbol in the top left hand corner. This means pending changes that you need to update and receive. So I'm going to do that. And around four to five seconds later, there is my new trust layout brought back into this document. My document is up to date. I can have a look at that in 3D looks pretty good to me. And I get a clearer picture of what my lighting design has been doing all the day. Now this could have been done completely anywhere. Overseas, I could have had a designer from anywhere in the world updating this particular layer that I've essentially leased out to them for the day. Now, because I haven't made any real changes here, I've just updated my file, I haven't actually done any work. If I just go file, close and release, I don't actually have anything to release, so my file will just close. If I'd changed the carpet, if I'd changed the stand layout a little bit, I would have been asked to commit those changes, but that's it, I'm done for the day. And everyone's signed off here in the office. Hopefully this has given you more of an overview of project sharing as a whole and the takeaway tips that you should be thinking about in your mind, which I'm going to pop on screen for you yet again, collaboration with others. You should always, always, always be talking direct IMs. Um, email just isn't quick enough. Talking to the people that you're collaborating with. Make sure you trust them. Make sure you know their skill levels. That's really, really important. And just remember this isn't a perfect practice. We haven't covered things like what happens if you break your project file here today. What happens if you have a broken link? What happens if two people try and commit at the same time and there's a save overlap? Those are kind of issues that you'll have to run into over time because we don't have time to cover every little detail today in this particular lesson. Remember that your Vectorworks forums are your biggest friend when you want to go down this path. So please make sure that you check in with the forum, research things before kind of asking more and more questions. There are a lot of answers out there and this isn't a perfect science yet, but Vectorworks are working on it. So hopefully as you bunker down for the next few months and find yourself having to collaborate in groups, hopefully this will help you along your way. Once again, I'm James Russell. If you found this video helpful, make sure you check out the Patreon, which I've just started up for this year. Additionally, make sure you're always checking back for the update video, which I'll include in the video description and here on screen, if you'd like to know more about where we're at and uh, what our intentions are for the future. Have a great day. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.